Chapter 2. Point of Entry When someone departs on a trip, especially if it is going to be a long one, a crowd of well-wishers gathers at the railway station or airport. Tears flow, as goodbyes are said, and promises to stay in touch are made by both parties. Most of us have been part of this scene at one time or another, so it is tempting to depict the start of our pilgrimage in these familiar terms. However, trips have distinct starting places, points from which you depart. The kind of pilgrimage that we are joining really does not. It is something that must be entered. Like diving into a fast-moving stream, the pilgrim quickly senses a living history that was flowing before their arrival and that will continue after they are long gone. When entering this pilgrimage, this search for a piece of God's heart, we join something bigger than ourselves. We have joined others in their devotion to a cause. We will slowly become bound together through the joys and hardships of the journey. In some miraculous way, we are entering into a human flow, for such a pilgrimage is not an individualistic affair. It is a communal event. Community had hardly been a part of my vocabulary as a typical American. I had always been comfortable living my life as an individual, making my own decisions, and pursuing my own goals. Like most of the men around me, I prided myself in being individualistic and self-sufficient. I assumed this journey would be the same. It seemed to me as if this was a part of the missionary ethos to be the kind of person who can leave homeland behind and strike out alone. However, I was soon to learn that my ideas and American ways were out of touch with the reality of life in Central Asia. I could not separate myself from those walking the trail alongside me or from the footprints of those who have gone before. As this realization dawned on me, I was brought closer to the goal of our journey, for, as we will discover later, indigenous churches are also communities. They are communities in ways that most of us have never really experienced in the West. But we must not linger long in the realm of theory. I believe I hear camels stirring. The Sound of Being Foreign It was a typical Friday afternoon in February. I had walked to the mosque beneath an overcast sky, with the temperature well below freezing. In the past, my trips to this brightly colored mosque had produced some incredibly focused times of spiritual warfare. Today, my visit would produce something different. Usually, I could find a quiet spot to kneel in the back of the large hall, an inconspicuous place from where I could intercede for the souls of the men around me who were devoutly following their prescribed acts of worship. Today, however, I had arrived at the mosque a little later than usual. The inside, nicely warmed, was packed wall to wall with bodies, and I was forced retreat to the large porch. There the wind and the snow fiercely bit at my face. I almost left. Inside I felt a strange, deep-seated resistance to being out in the open. I did not want to be out on that porch where I was exposed and much more aware of my exposure. The shiver that traveled down my spine was caused by something more intimidating than the howling wind. I tucked myself almost under a set of stairs, hoping that no one would notice that I was not participating in the Islamic prayers. As I settled in this quiet spot, I hoped that I would blend in. I received some puzzled looks as men shuffled by, but thankfully most of them had other things on their minds, perhaps frostbite. None of them paid much attention to me. For this I was glad. I was trying hard to go unnoticed while they were offering their prayers, for I knew that to be seen was to be found out. To be seen was to announce to them all that I did not belong. As the speakers crackled and the wind blew light snow around our heads, the few hundred men began their worship. With military-like cadence, they went through the physical motions that correspond with Islamic prayers, turning the head to the right and left to acknowledge the angels supposed to be on either side, cupping the hands to the ears, which symbolizes listening to Allah, and bowing prostrate on the ground to show submission. 
Each time the assembly of men dropped to their knees, the massive floor timbers shook from the force of their unity. And as they did, an unspoken message seemed to telegraph through my body and into my heart. I felt discordant, totally out of place. That, in turn, sent tiny signals out to the hairs on the back of my neck, something we normally call fear. I am not sure why that day was any different. The routine had not changed. But this time, I could almost hear it in the creaking floor joists and the crackle of the old loudspeakers. Deep inside, it resonated repeatedly. You are different. You do not belong. You are all alone. Then it struck me. For one brief moment, in the slightest of ways, I understood what it must feel like to come out of Islam and follow Isa as Messiah and Savior. For a fleeting moment, I had the incredible sensation of being out of sync with everyone else around me. For my new brothers and sisters in Christ, this feeling is a daily part of their lives. All of Central Asia, their whole world, is moving in unison. At times, they must feel hopelessly out of its rhythm. Most of them probably go through life desperately trying to hide in some corner, praying and hoping that no one notices them, just as I did that cold February afternoon. Kneeling on those well-worn carpets, I had heard the sound of being foreign. It could have shown me how little I understood what it means to be a Central Asian follower of Isa. I could have realized that I would never face the pressures they encounter when they embrace Christ. I could have recognized that I would never experience the deep sense of pain that comes from living out of sync with one's own community. I should have learned a lot that day, but the truth is that I didn't, at least not for a long time. It was only in the following years that hindsight made these things clear. It had been an important moment in my journey. Too bad I did not see it at the time. Still, on that blustery Friday, God sowed in this pilgrim heart the seeds of truly indigenous thinking. They took a long time to bear fruit. Perhaps I am more hard-headed than others, but something inside had begun to change. Costly Advice The apricot trees outside were in full bloom, and the afternoon was awash with countless cups of tea, many more than I would have wanted. But I was doing what is expected of a guest in Central Asia and giving my host temporary control of my life. We were sitting on floor cushions around a low table with a carpet hanging on the whitewashed mud wall behind me. My gracious host with the bottomless teapot was a schoolteacher, a former Muslim who was now a follower of Isa. He also happened to be one of the most respected church leaders in the region. It was because of my high regard for Mukhtar that I had traveled four or five hours for this visit. I wanted his advice on a list of important matters. However, it was not until later that I would learn the price to be paid for his wisdom. After the effort it had taken to get there, I wanted to keep this particular meeting on track. Being a linear thinker, I feel good when a meeting goes according to my plan and become impatient and restless when I am unsure of where the conversation is going. As the afternoon wore on, I started feeling adrift. I could not bring the meeting into focus. In fact, it was starting to feel less like a meeting and more like a chat over a pot of tea. I couldn't even nudge us toward the first item on my agenda. The longer we talked, the harder I tried to turn our conversation to things more important, at least important as I counted them. After hours of frustrating small talk, the conversation finally took an encouraging turn. As he poured me yet another cup, Mukhtar looked me in the eyes and said, You know, I like your ministry methods. Like a sunbeam on a gray, rainy afternoon, his words warmed my soul. A mild sense of frustration had been simmering within me because of my neglected list. Now, in its place sprouted a tiny blade of self-satisfaction as I contemplated these ministry methods of mine. 
Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Before I could start to gloat, Mukhtar continued, You came to see me without a plan, and that's the right way to do things in our culture. When someone comes to me with a list of things to discuss, they show that I'm only their business, a project to be done. But ministry is not business. It is all about relationships. His simple words, intended as a compliment, caught me unaware, like the suddenness of a sandstorm in the desert. One moment everything is fine and you can see to the horizon. The next you can't tell where you are. In a sense, I already knew this. After all, I had been a pastor in what seems like a previous life, and I am very much a people person. Nonetheless, as a product of my culture, I still placed a high value on schedules, plans, lists, and agendas. These things are measurable. These things are valuable. Although I would never have admitted it to anyone else, these things proved to the world I was busy, and as a busy person I was important. At least that's the way things had been counted back home in my world. But I was no longer in my world. I was now in his world in Central Asia. By his words and by his actions, Mukhtar was telling me that people and relationships take precedence over my beloved lists and agendas in this strange place he calls home. Despite the fact that I had been living in Central Asia for two or three years, I had somehow avoided truly entering his world. I had managed to live in a facade built to perfectly match my comfort zone. Now Mukhtar's kindly spoken words had shattered that illusion and startled me into reality. Without knowing it, my friend had shaken my internal compass, and now I could not find my bearings. One moment I was reveling in my good ministry methods. The next one, much of my worldview was lost in a swirling confusion. Mukhtar progressed to other topics, but I was stuck. The suddenness of it all had left me struggling. Part of me rejected what he had said, as it was just too hard to process. But another part hungered to see the world the way Mukhtar did, to reorient my compass to his north star. The rest of the afternoon was a blur. I do not remember anything else we talked about. As my host kept the time-honored rhythm with his teapot, I fought with an internal reality shift. His words had struck a deep, uncomfortable chord within me. I could not even begin to concentrate on the rest of the conversation. The questions taking shape in my heart were almost audible. Will I really hear what he has to say? How much am I willing to pay for the wisdom that will come from listening to this man? Somehow I knew that the answers would be expensive to me personally, perhaps costing more than I was willing to pay. It wasn't until much later that I remembered the words of a wise man who once said, Though it cost you all you have, get understanding. When counting the cost for overseas missionary service, no one had told me that it might include a severely bruised ego. My benign friend had not intentionally assaulted my self-esteem, and I know he wasn't being slyly sarcastic. That trait is neither in his personality nor in his culture. Mukhtar simply hadn't seen my mental agenda or the list in my coat pocket. What I experienced that day was just one example of how a pilgrim is often required to purchase costly advice. But the expense is justifiable, for little by little such insights will shape our journey. As a Western missionary who was addicted to his schedule, I had started out my pilgrimage with lists and agendas that seemed important— so important, in fact, that I almost trashed an invaluable friendship for their sake. But for the grace of God, I might have communicated to this dear man that the cost of learning from him was too high for busy, important pilgrims like me.